Hey everybody, Gene Jackson here inviting you to check out the Retro Wrestling Review, where each week I'm joined by some great co-hosts who help me review classic episodes of USWA Championship Wrestling, and right now we are doing week-by-week reviews of 1993. But we don't just do reviews, sometimes we get a chance to interview some of the people who were there and lived it, plus do watch-alongs. It's a lot of fun, so check out new episodes that drop every Wednesday at WrestleCopia.com. And to find links to everything associated to the podcast, you can go to uswapodcast.com. Welcome to another episode of Retro Wrestling, right here on the Retro Wrestling Archive YouTube channel. I'm your host, Gene Jackson, and I'm excited about this episode. This is one I've been wanting to do for a little while, and so uh, I know a lot of you are aware that I'm a part of the WrestleCopia brand over at WrestleCopia.com, and there's a number of great podcasts over there, and I, uh, I have my hand in at least two almost three, I guess, if you include being a a regular special guest on uh, regional wrestling. But a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of friends of mine, uh, once they started seeing me promote WrestleCopia, went and checked out WrestleCopia and we appreciate that. And you started listening and, and you started asking me like, Hey man, so who's this Ray Russell guy? He seems to be knowledgeable. Uh, he seems to know about wrestling. He seems to be invested. His, his, podcasts are well thought out they're well laid out they're thorough he knows his stuff but where'd he come from what's what's his deal and so i thought well hey who better than to tell you guys what ray russell's deal is than ray russell so let's get him on the show right now (laughs) ray welcome to retro wrestling what's happening money bags gene jackson oh jesus you gotta stop that (laughs) You've got to fucking stop that, seriously. <laughs> oh, it's uh, good to be on uh, somebody else's show for once. I love it. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, man. This is one where you didn't have to spend all day researching. You're not going to have to uh, spend a day and a half editing. <laughs> oh, my God, no. Um, so what so you're yeah, saying I, is this is not a Bob Roop show. Sorry, you Bob. You said that. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, certainly didn't say that at all, but uh, <laughs> but no, man. Welcome to the show. It's good to have you on. And uh, you know, me and you probably met. What was it? Probably a year or so ago at this point. I guess I don't know. Time time all runs together for me. So I'm probably not really getting close to it. Timelines, but uh, I discovered uh, WrestleCopia through the Bob Roop show. I heard like, wow, somebody's doing a podcast with Bob Roop, like. <laughs> Let's let's see what this is about. And so I checked yeah. it out, and uh, then I realized that oh, Russell Copia is a whole network. And so <laughs> right. got to looking around, and you had at the time um, just I think you had just done the uh, Survivor Series '87 on oh, yeah. the Grenade, mm-hmm. and uh, I love me some early Survivor Series as as we've spoke about off the air and and on the air on some of our yeah. video casts over at Russell Copia, which we'll talk about eventually uh, here <laughs> here in a little bit. Uh, so man, I checked that out, and then all of a sudden I was all in on Russell Copia. I was going back listening to the Grenade back to NWA '89, and uh, just it's winter time at my job. I sit there, I work by myself, uh, so there's no one else there. So I get to sit and just <laughs> listen to podcasts all day if that's what I want to do. So, Right. As I'm sure you remember, I was just uh, going through, like just plowing through, you know, episodes and episodes of The Grenade and all the different shows, and I'm sending you messages and 
somehow from there that uh, that spun into me doing re uh, the regional wrestling show with you, Memphis '85, and I'm having a blast doing that. Yeah, that's good stuff. And, uh, <laughs> so, I guess the the start out. Uh, we're not going to tell everything about Ray Russell. We got to have a little bit of air of mystery to you, but you know, I feel like for a guy to to dedicate as much time and effort as you clearly do into professional wrestling podcasts, there has to be a pretty deep rooted fandom there somewhere. So tell yeah. me a little bit about <laughs> where, when you think back in your mind, where professional wrestling picks up in your life. Oh, the sickness. You know, a lot of people like to go, I remember when I was three. I remember when I was four. That's when I became a complete fan. I can't say that. I can tell you, though, for anybody who's ever had a few too many cocktails and woke up the next day blackout, uh, throughout the day, you'll get those flashes. Memory flashes will come back at you. And so I have these memory flashes of being three and four and Tommy Rich and uh, Buzz Sawyer and Gordon Soley and no vivid memory of a feud or anything. I, I, I love this guy. I hated that guy. But Georgia Championship Wrestling was local to Ohio in the early to mid 80s. And so on the local channel 61, because we did not have cable in Cleveland until 87 ish. And so in, in the city proper. And right. so in like that period in time, we had Georgia syndicated up to us on channel 61, which would eventually become the home shopping network around 86 or so. But that's kind of my very earliest memory. But my real memories are from that Hulk and Rock and Wrestling era. Uh, NBC Saturday morning cartoons in between the cartoons. Mr. T and Hulk Hogan running down the sidewalks of New York City preparing for WrestleMania. And, and just, we talked about this off air before, just the marketing. The silly marketing of the Killer Bees. They stuck them in bumblebee tights. But they called them the Killer Bees. And that was cool for a five-year-old, right? And... So that stuck. And Hillbilly Jim, which I was never a huge fan of, but he had a gimmick, so I remember him. Roddy Piper. You, everybody's afraid of the big guys, afraid of Bundy, afraid of Stud. I was afraid of Roddy Piper because of his promos. He seemed like the guy that would kill you, right? So that was the guy I feared more than just these bad guys that were big and bad. It was the guys that talked like that. So my first memories really are that the beginning, the inception of the, the Hulkamania era, the end of the Georgia run in the Cleveland territory, the Cleveland area. So from that, folks, you can gather that Ray is from Cleveland, if you haven't picked that up from listening to the podcast. I think he's left enough breadcrumbs throughout <laughs> throughout time in the podcast to know that, that Ray's from the Ohio area. So that's where you kind of remember it starting. And I, I'm kind of similar to where, like, my memories of wrestling, like, I can remember my dad having it on and be like, hey, Gene, look, hey, there's, look at the Road Warriors, or look at this person or that person, or, and I'd come in there and stop playing with my toy truck or whatever and watch it for a few minutes and then I'd go back right. to what I was doing. And where I, the first time I really remember being like, whoa, what's this? And really starting to invest in it is like Jake putting Damien on somebody. I was like, okay. whoa, yeah. that's, That'll that's do wild. That'll do it. That's different. And, uh, and then, then I start, you know, I, from 86 is when it really starts, you know, I start latching on and I, and I start like, oh, hey, this comes on at this time. I need to watch this. And then I start realizing that, you know, oh, Memphis wrestling's on at this time and Continental's on at this time and and the AWA's on every friggin' day and, and you know, through the week and all right, that. Yeah. And I really start, you know, dialing into it. When do you start remembering that you're becoming a fan and like you say, you the sickness is setting in and it's like it ain't just something that you kind of remember or you kinda of like. It's like oh, so I it was taking all this I can. Right. No, no. It was, it was a little slow at first. If it was on, I would, like you said, I would catch 10 minutes of it here and there. Oh, that was cool. The B guys wrestled or junkyard dog loved him. Just loved the charisma and everything about him. Um, obviously guys like that stuck out to me. And so that went on for a while, but I was five and six years old. So I still love me some Saturday morning cartoons. So I had to get those in and then wrestling would come on after and I'd see a little bit of that, maybe some fall guy thing, but I, I can't really pinpoint. I think my era would have probably been right around, as you say, yours was, was 86, but it was a slow go. Okay. Now I'm watching full episodes. Cool. But I only knew WWF at that point. And then I realized over here on channel 43 or whatever it was, we had worldwide Crockett and then. Uh, eventually cable came into Cleveland because it started in the suburbs and, and they wired it towards the main city. Now, I don't know if that was because it was easier to start in the suburbs because there's less homes or if that was just a financial thing, like all oh, the people in the suburbs are more willing to spend money than maybe the people in the inner city. 
but eventually we got cable and I, I think we, we got cable right after they okayed it and, and they wired it and got it all set up, which is like the beginning of 88. So when Jamie Ward talks about, I got cable in 81, I said, like, well, good for you. We didn't even have, it wasn't even available. I knew what cable was, but in the city proper, we weren't available to have it until close to 1988. And by that point, then I learned, you know, more channels and things. And that's when you accidentally stumble upon ESPN. Oh, there's AWA. Oh, there's Dallas. And that was really where it came because it came right around. Everything all at once kind of came together throughout 87 because it was, I learned there was more wrestling. Uh, the magazine, I started off a few, a few uh, WWF magazines, cool pictures. The guys that I'm watching on TV, very cool, especially for a kid about four months into grabbing these magazines. I'm at a newsstand grocery store, whatever. And there's other wrestling magazines. And who are these guys? And holy shit, what's all going on in, you know, inside the pages. And mm -hmm. that's when my world opened up. And I think that's what really sucked me in that and the characters that they started developing, you know, and I won't say I started really getting hooked with the warrior, but I do remember upon the, the beginning and inception of the push of the warrior too, I really latched onto that. So I, I, I put the rocket ship on my back along with the warrior's ascension and so people are like, oh, they done with this with guy. The rocket fuel. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so I'm sure people are done with this interview now, but it wasn't just Warrior. I loved all the territories, all the promotions, but that was my, you know, the colorful, larger than life character and, and just everything around that. And the tag teams, I love the tag teams at the time. Everything hooked me all at once. You mentioned the magazines. I was a big collector of wrestling magazines. Do you remember who was on the cover of the first one you ever purchased? Hmm. That's tough. I wish I could say that's a good question. It would have been an 87 probably. And I, I don't know off the top of my head. I feel like it was a macho man, but it, it may not have been. I, I was going to say, I, if I was, if you have made me bet money <laughs> on what it was going to be, I was going to say a macho man as well. well you can't uh, go wrong with Piper, that one. Actually. Okay. Um, I was, I was always a big Piper fan. Um, okay. Well here's okay. Here's a wrestling nerd question. Do you remember, What's the first wrestling VHS tape you ever rented back in the day? Rented? Ooh. Yes. Yes. WrestleMania one. Oh, that's a good, that's a good place to start. That was, uh, that was my cousin's ideas before we had a VCR in my house. And, uh, we said, we're going to, we're going to go back and try to watch as much of the earlier stuff from that, you know, that they were putting out as we could to kind of learn everything that we didn't know. And WrestleMania one at that point in time has just been folklore to me. It was like, Oh yeah, Hogan and Mr. T Roddy Piper, Mr. Wonderful. But what happened? I don't know. And uh, when we go there, there's, there's newer videotapes that I wanted to see. I'm a kid. I know all these names and I knew, I knew the main guys in there, but it was the SD Joneses and the guys like that. And my cousin goes, Hey, if we're going to do this, let's do it from the beginning. And he rented WrestleMania one and probably a couple best of WWFs and we were off to the races. That cartoon drawing of Hogan and Mr. T on the front was a was a kind of a that was awesome. grabber as well. Yeah. I thought that was pretty yeah. awesome. First time I With saw the, the video store. Black like, background. Oh. They they really yeah, stuck out. Like, yeah. What's this? Yeah. Um I remember, yeah, before we got a VCR, uh it took it took a two or three weeks of, of selling, uh before I did any <laughs> retail sales as a <laughs> as an adult back in the day. Two of my biggest sell jobs was number one, selling my parents on renting a VCR. The second one was selling my dad on buying a Nintendo. And that was uh -huh. two months of me telling him how awesome Duck Hunt was because he loved hunting <laughs> and that's that's what sold it. Oh, uh, but I remember stuff. we rented a we rented a VCR and uh, for the week for the whole weekend. And so that particular store, uh, I remember we got Great American Bash eighty six uh, WWF's most unusual matches. Good one. And, I bought uh, that one. The uh, first two WrestleManias, WrestleMania one and two. And oh, I had two. I watched I had the Bash '86 first. That's like the first wrestling VHS I ever ever watched. And I ended up eventually nice. buying it. And every year in the summertime, I always watch this like tradition. Since then, every year I watch the Great American Bash '86, which is just one of those weird things. Just like how every Every year at Thanksgiving, I watch Survivor Series like 87, 88, 89. 89, right? Yeah. Uh, sometimes I'll throw 90 in there if I'm feeling frisky, but not always. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm similar. I'm an 88, 89, 90 guy, but I'm with you. Yeah. 91, 
It starts, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, that angered me uh, barely. They start losing me there, but uh, but yeah. Um, but anyway, so I guess I, I guess this is a big leap here from where we've been where we've been going. But yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, I've heard it said that the great Brian Last. Uh, listened to wrestling podcasts and decided that he could do do one better, and that's what led uh-huh. him to start his his podcast empire, if you will. Uh, what what made you decide that podcasting, uh, doing a wrestling podcast, was something that interests you? Well, I mean, there's two parts to that, and it goes to both parts of podcasting, which is a, it's about wrestling, so wrestling knowledge. B, it's about podcasting, so you know, you know how that works, you know, the broadcasting skills or whatever you want to call it. It's kind of the gift of gab, I guess, in a way. And it really, both of those go back to my childhood. Uh, you know, I used to pull off the old cassette tape. We'd record it. We would pretend to do radio shows as kids, 10 years old to 13, 14 years old, pre-internet guys. So that's how we entertained ourselves back then. I mean, my cousin's over, my brother over. I still have some of the tapes. Uh, on the weekend, you remember the old radio call-in shows? I don't know if they still exist now. Whether it was the talk shows on the AM or the FM call-in and, uh, you know, request a song, I would see how many times I could call in and do a different voice, do a different character. I was Elvis on the 50s show. They loved talking to me every week. I ran out of Elvis songs. I, I, I requested a Bobby Darren song. They busted out laughing. and They go, I didn't know Elvis liked Bobby Darren. I said, oh, you got to like somebody beside yourself. They loved So I, I had a, a weekly also on that 50s call-in. I was a character named Poffo. And I would read a poem to him every week. And I did it in the landing. And every week I say, I just want to say hi to my, my father, Angelo, my brother, Randy, and, uh, my, and Lanny. Randy and Lanny, my, my, my brothers. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's so I, I kind of, it was like I couldn't be on the radio. So I found ways to be on the radio where we would mimic being on the radio. So I did that all the way growing up and in high school. And ever, my math teacher in 10th grade, he used to say to me all the time, you belong on the radio. You belong in broadcasting. And I was like, kind of like, yeah, I know. Because it was just my my personality, and yeah. but on top, you know, you add with that the wrestling, right? So it just it made sense, and other people would do it, and it was like I never really tried to learn how to do it, and then I would say because I've had a lot going on in my life during the two thousands and whatnot that technology passed me by to a degree, and I allow I saw it happening, but I was like I don't have time for that. I don't care. Not just podcasting, just everything. And eventually when things kind of settled down a little bit, I was like, man, I'd love to do that, but really know where to jump in. You know, there's certain channels that are websites that had podcasting, but I I didn't have, I I didn't have the namesake to get in them like the guys that did at that point in time. And then slowly other people would trickle in and they had podcasts and I go, well, this guy didn't even know that I know, I know that. And not that I, oh, because I know more than this guy that, but it was like, I could easily hang with that conversation. I wish I was in there with these guys so that we could all, you know, discuss this. And so that, that never happened. So once, you know, one day, um, guy that some people may recognize name wise was Steve was my original co-host on the grenade show. Um, we would, we would talk daily. You remember the old AOL days? So we would oh, yeah. talk every night on the AOL while I'm doing whatever I'm doing. And Steve goes, you know, oh, you ever think about doing one of these? I don't even remember if they were called podcasts by that point. But I said, yeah, yeah, I thought about it, but I don't know what to do with it. He goes, oh, you record, blah, blah, blah. So I figured the basics out, and we recorded a pre-show, like a build-up to, to, to a WrestleMania. And I couldn't even tell you which one. I don't even remember the matches. So it was around 31, 32-ish in the WrestleManias. Yeah. And we record one. I said, man, that came off good. I went back, I listened to it. I said, that really came off good. The problem was I didn't know where to post it. <laughs> so it was right. cool to have. But So then WrestleMania happened the following week. And he's like, hey, do you want to do a post show? I said, okay. And we recorded that. And that flowed pretty well. I thought I did, you know, we did a good job breaking it down. And I said, well, now I got this and I have nowhere to post it. And I, hopefully I still have it somewhere. I can find it one day. But that's why I don't even remember which WrestleMania it was. But that's how it started. It's like, oh, is that all there is? Like, that was nothing. It was pretty simple to do. And then it just laid dormant for a few years. And I moved and COVID and there was nothing going on. And a uh, guy by the name of Mickey Arbor, this was in summer of 2020, who was uh, co-owners of a website, still I believe still exists, the Retro Network. I think they rebranded it Geekster now. Mickey Arbor was a guy who uh, used to do fantasy wrestling and go on the Wrestling Classics board. 
and he came to me one day and I don't think he had wrestling in mind, but he said, Hey, did you think, you know, do you think you might want to join our retro website and do a podcast? And I said, Oh, that'd be cool. Could I, could it be wrestling? And I knew he knew wrestling. He knew. So his response was, well, we already have guys that do that, but let me go check with my co co-owner, uh, who's no longer, you know, he passed away. Unfortunately, G- Jason gross. He gave him the Iggy. He said, okay, give him a try. And we put the show on there. But before we did, I went to Steve and I said, Hey man, this is going to cost me to get this thing going for the microphone the software, the everything I said up front, this is going to cost me about a grand to get going. I have a grand sitting aside, literally all of my, you know, extra money laying around. I said, so if we're going to do this, we have to, like, this is total dedication on my end. And he was like, yeah, man, sure. Yeah, that's cool. And so we did a couple shows for the retro network and it wasn't really getting the play that I wanted it to. Um, and I don't blame them because they were a full website <laughs> with a bunch of other retro stuff. Yeah. And so after a couple of weeks, I go to Steve and like, Hey man, we, maybe we can just go take this thing and move it over here. I talked to the guys that were running that website. They were like, yeah, that's cool. Hey man, if you put that much money into it, you, you know, go give it a try, do whatever you want to do. They're really cool about it. And so Russell Copey was born though. The idea was already there. If you listen to the first sentence of the first episode of the grenade, when we were on the retro network, I said the Russell Copey brand. So the idea was already there. And so it just, it, you know, went on from there. We'll return after these messages. Hey guys, Ray Russell here, curator of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, inviting you guys to listen to many of the programs here as part of the WrestleCopia brand, including, but not limited to, the Wrestling Memory Grenade, currently covering the 1988 and the WWF project. You can also listen to the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories whether it's Jamie Ward with Georgia 81, Roman Gomez with the UWF in 1986, or Gene Jackson covering Memphis in 85. Three projects going on right now over there at Regional Wrestling. You can also listen to the Wrestling Stoop with the legend himself, Bob Roop. Bob goes back in time each and every week, covering not just his career, but countless stories and interactions with hundreds of wrestling names spanning his two decades in the business. But that's not all. You can also check out the Puro Wrestling Academy with the professor of Puro Resu, Mr. Dan Ginnity. Dan and I go back in time and cover the history of Japanese professional wrestling in the English language. And you can listen to all of those shows and more, all part of the WrestleCopia podcast network located over at WrestleCopia.com. That's WrestleCopia.com and anywhere your podcast streaming needs are met from Apple to Spotify, Pocket Cast, and beyond. And while you're at it, why not subscribe to our social media guys for all the latest goings on here at the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. Plus, I'm constantly adding old school video clips and pictures from throughout wrestling history. You can follow us over on X, formerly Twitter, at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R-A-S-S-L-I-N Grenade. Also, follow and like me, Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And why not subscribe to YouTube.com? slash wrestling grenade so if you're looking to support that next up and coming podcast brand please consider making it wrestlecopia hey guys this is wolfie d from pg13 check out my podcast live and in color with wolfie d every monday at noon we're talking memphis we're talking ecw wcw wwf everywhere that i've been we even have some great guests some hall of famers on the show with us every monday at noon live and in color with wolfie d at you with it starting out with a grand you want to call somebody money bags that was no more after that (laughs) it was covid man i had nowhere to go i couldn't spend it right so (laughs) so so what led you to that name russell copia that that you threw that out there in those initial episodes i think like every human being on earth about the beginning of the 2000s i tried to start a wrestling news site and i believe i dubbed it russell copia don't know where it came from then but that was about 25 years ago. And uh, obviously it didn't work out because I was just taking the, the stories from pro wrestling in line or 411 wrestling at the time or whatever the whatever yeah. the case may be, who were taking it from Meltzer. And I was kind of third handing it there for a few months. And, and then Russell Copia went away <laughs> for about 20 years. And then it, and then it was back in a, in a different world, a podcasting world. Well, that's cool. Like, 
yeah, I started uh, like I started doing podcasts in like 2007, and it was just interviews with like local indie guys where I, where I'm at in Alabama and everything. And um, you know, and I was like you, I always studied wrestling my whole life just because I was a fan of it. But I just I wanted to learn everything I could find on it. You know, I read every book I could get my hands on, read every magazine yeah. I could get my hands on, watched every video I could trade for. All that good stuff, and uh, after doing podcasts off and on for all those years, it was really just around the time that I discovered WrestleCopia, and I was like, I, I had always wanted to do stuff like like that, you know, talk about old wrestling. But I was like, man, there's all these old wrestlers that have podcasts you know, that was there. I'm like, who's going to listen to me? Because I wasn't actually there. But like right. you, and again, not being trying to be arrogant or anything but just like you listen to a lot of these shows and be it wrestlers who were there or other guys who have deemed themselves experts somehow uh there's a lot of historians oh yeah historians uh yeah that's a fun term everybody misuses these days i'm telling uh, you who either just don't know or they get facts wrong or my biggest issue with the the alleged wrestling historians these days is opinions that they present as facts facts right yeah and listeners that you see <laughs> in the comments echoing these opinions as facts who are now you know are now spreading that to other people um, yeah i have no problem mm -hmm. with you if you do a podcast and you can garner listeners to listen to your opinions that's great but present them as opinions don't present them as facts because that's facts right? really yeah. absurd <laughs> shit <laughs> getting thrown out as facts and they're and they're just stating as if it is this absolutely the god's gospel and it's it's yeah. kind of crazy so i thought uh, well man i know you know i've spent more than more, uh, more than a half my life the majority of my life studying wrestling like uh -huh. i should use this for something i should feel like i'm not you know wasting all this time and uh I got time, like I said, around that time, I started listening to WrestleCopia and all your different podcasts, and you put it on Facebook that you were looking for someone to uh, be a guest host for Memphis 1985, and Jamie yeah. Ward tagged me in it, because I know Jamie Ward from, from back in the day. And I say she, I say you should be calling money bags. Got cable back in yeah. 1981. Jeez. <laughs> Freaking steak dinner every night, too, if you go to his yeah. Facebook. Yeah. So yeah. This guy. Oh, old big time Jamie. But, um, uh, there you go but yeah man uh <laughs> tell me a little bit about how you, you you know so wrestle so wrestlecopia starts out with the wrestling memory grenade mm -hmm. which starts out with nwa 89 tell us a right. little bit about what went into the decision as that was going to be your jumping off point how you kind of came up with the format that you used just you know we, we figure out how you got there but what what was your plan once you started so if you couldn't tell by now, the based on the way I look things up, even for the Jerry Lawler shows, I'm very anal about information, right? So I'm going to get every bit of information I can, and then some if I can find more. It's like I told you when I did the grenade in 93, when they started trotting out kids and ringing out, guest ring announcers, I started looking up, you know, what, what happened to them in, in the world. And I go, you know what? After I, after, you know, I did that for a few weeks and I found out what happened, what became of some of these people, I go, it's kind of morbid. I'm not going to do this anymore. But <laughs> now going back... So NW89, there was never anything else in the running with it. Like there was never a poll. There was never, do you want to do this or this? It was, we're doing NW89 to start. That was just a year I wanted to tackle and dissect. It's kind of, it's a huge year for the NWA as far as Flair gets Steamboat, he gets Funk and, you know, everything that goes along with Sting's, you know, yeah, he beat, he had the, the draw with Flair in 88, but it was really Sting's big breakout year, I felt, and Luger's heel turn was pretty damn cool and, uh, everything that went along with, with 89, the Steiners, the skyscrapers, everything in between. But I didn't really know it week to week, right? It's like I, I can yeah. do WWF pretty good without actually watching it. But I still find little things that I don't didn't know or didn't remember right now, even in 88 WWF. But in WA89, there were all sorts of little fun things, and I wanted to tackle all that. But I also wanted a reason to watch all this stuff. And that's why I go back to, I told Steve, my co-host at the time, when we started this thing, we're going to go and we're going to dissect the year. And there, you know, people like to do the pay-per-views, the clashes, the main TV. Nobody really looks at the, the, the pros or what would become the power hour. Um, the Saturday morning show they had where David Crockett was host. 
and they had to bring in Cornette and Polly to rotate. Look at him. Watch him kick like a dog. Kick like a dog. <laughs> so I said, if we're going to do this, we're going to dissect it. And Steve was kind of like, okay, we'll do the big stuff, the big TV. I go, well, no, if I can find it, we're going to do everything I can find. And I, you know, I do the news too. And then another thing I've always done is set the stage. I don't like to start anybody off hitting the ground running. I don't want to pretend like everybody that listens to the show for the first time knows everything that happened up until this day. Why am I covering 87 WWF if you already know everything that happened in 86? Because if you did, why would you be, you, you likely know what happened in 87. Right. So I, I always like to set the stage and cover that. So that's what I wanted to do. What was happening? I knew some of the basics of what was happening going into 89, the Crockett sale to, you know, Turner, Dusty was leaving, all that stuff, but everything else, what was happening. And so break it down. That's what I wanted to do for the first show was kind of explain what was going on. We got into TV and all the little stuff was fun. And all those little things, you, you catch extra promos, extra little bits to a feud that you don't, you never saw before. You didn't remember at the very least. And that was kind of how it went. And I had Steve ask me maybe after the first show, maybe after the second show, he goes, you think maybe we shouldn't do all this? I, I think, I think it was overwhelming for him. And I said, no, dude, if this is what we're doing, this is what we're doing. And he was cool. And I feel like we got about five months in like May of 89. He asked me the same question again. I think again, power hour was coming. I think it was getting overwhelming. No knock on him. It just, you know, it was what the way I was presenting it, I guess. And all he had to do was watch it. He, that was it. Like I was trying to do it. I took the notes and I said, I, I, there was, we got to a point, you know, I'm going to break the fourth wall here. We got, we got to the point where I felt like maybe he just, it was just too much. And I told him, I said, just watch the main TV. I already watched everything. Don't watch this show. Don't watch this show. And to his, because you're not going to miss anything. So yeah. there's, and to his credit though, he was like, no, nah, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to watch it. So to his credit, as far as I know, you know, he was watching, you know, everything along with me. But as the time progressed in 89, I felt, uh, you know, just kind of, I don't want to say losing interest, but just too much. He, you know, other endeavors for Steve. And so that's why a lot of people, are, why did you pick 93 WWF? And it was really, if anybody didn't notice in these little nods that he would give to that era on the 89 NWA, that was his wheelhouse, right? It's like, that was the first full year of wrestling. Sorry, Steve. That's, <laughs> I mean, he loves it, but that was like his first year. He remembered watching every episode, the beginning of raw, blah, blah, blah. So I thought, you know what? He did this for me. I'll do that. And not that he didn't enjoy Flair Funk and Muda and Sting and things like that. But I said, I'll do this for him. And I set that up. I thought it would reinvigorate everything, keep things flowing, but it just wasn't meant to be, you know, he kind of lost interest and slowly you'll notice he, you know, starts to disappear here and there. I had to do shows anyway and put them out. And that's really, I think May 93 WWF was where I learned. I was really, um, it was, I was trepidatious about doing it. Uh -huh. Uh huh. But uh, he had canceled on me so many times. This was like the last straw that day, and I said I can't not put another show out again this week. And so I just went in and did it myself. And I said, you know what? Not ideal, but it was not that hard to do. And I think a lot of that, and I talked to you about this off air too, was watching Joey Styles. Mm -hmm. I didn't purposely try to, you know, imitate Joey Styles. I don't think I'm. I don't think I sound anything like Joey Styles, but I think having watched him week to week for several years there in the peak ECW, what I call the peak ECW, which was like 95, 96, 97, watching him do that week to week for so long, it was like, you're not, you're not talking to the people you're talking with the people. And that's what I try to do when I'm by myself. Yeah. And that's, and I know exactly what you're referring to there because most announcers be it announcing on a wrestling show like Joey Styles was or doing a show with the format that you had been doing with Steve is you speak to a point and then you you leave an opening for someone to, f to fill in their their opinions or for them to comment or, or, or what or respond or whatever the case may be and I, Joey was really good at filling the space where I think with mo most announcers, if they had tried to do that by themselves, you would have really felt like, all right, somebody else should be speaking right here. Here's yeah. where their other person would be talking. 
but Joey Styles filled the void where you're like, no, I mean, we don't need another guy. Like, he's got this. And I, kudos to you having done the entire 89 NWA and then that many months of WWF up to that point. And then all of a sudden you're thrust into, well, I got to figure this out by myself and, and, and not make it sound, you know, odd or you know, one, like a one-sided conversation yeah. where somebody's going, where's the other side of this? Uh, it's, it's, it's harder to do than people think. I mean, if you're listening to this, if you've done any podcasting or aspire to do any podcasting, uh, try doing a show like Ray does by yourself. I, I've told him this, I don't know how many times off the air that I, I'm always amazed when I listen to the grenade, how well he's, he managed to do that because there's a, there's a, a certain amount of energy you have to bring to it oh, and man. inflection and everything because, <laughs> again, there's going to be no response. There's going to be no feedback from another person. You're not pitching it to anybody. So you have to keep the, the, the energy up. It's, it's just a different delivery. Uh, you know, oh. I, I'm glad you pointed out kind of where you where maybe you indirectly was inspired by Joey Styles. You kind of realized it after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, that's it's. There's definitely it's a whole different animal to try to do what you've done with the grenade, and uh, and that's what really stood out to me. You know, like I say, the very first one I listened to, you were doing Survivor Series with your brother, and then I listened to '89 with you and Steve, and then when I hit the grenades where it was just you, I was like, well, this will be interesting. You know, how's he going to do this? And I thought that before I started the first one when I when I realized it was just going to be you. And then by the time I got to the end of it, I'll go, I didn't even miss that other person. Like, actually, I liked it better than certain other people. <laughs> when certain other people are on there. Yeah, I've, uh, not, I've, not got, I've gotten that response. Either. No, I've, I've, I've heard a thing or two or three <laughs> over time. <laughs> I, know what, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and boy, I tell you, I mean, I, I understand you, you know, doing that for Steve's benefit because, because Hey, that's not a knock on him or anybody else. We all have any wrestling fan, any fan of anything really, but wrestling, especially we all have that weird wheelhouse of this is where our fandom picked up, or oh, yeah. this is a certain time period in our lives or our fandom that just means something to us. And that's necessarily mm -hmm. no reflection on how good or bad the wrestling was. It's oh. just, you, you associate that with a time in your life or whatever it is. And, hey, 93 is his jam. I get that. Um, but for you to have to do that, for that to have to be where you start doing this by yourself and try to make 93 sound fun and interesting in the WWF. Ooh, but if you can do that, I guess at that point, you know, you can do anything. <laughs> well, that's, you know, I'll never forget that day uh, doing doing that May episode. It was kind of make it or break it. I, I literally probably sat there for the better part of 30 minutes uh, sitting at my desk going, this is it. Either I do this by myself or this is it. It's done. Everything's done. I built all this to, to it's going to end right here. And I said, you know what? F it. I'm not going to let anybody else make the decision for me on what's going to happen with WrestleCopia. And so I just kept going. And we, we went on from there. And uh, it wasn't just going to be the grenade, but the grenade was meant to be the, the, the start gate. Um, you know, as much as I grew up on the 80s WWF, so I love it. You know, yeah. it's always going to have a very special place in my heart, but I love the territory era equally, if not more, because there's so much more of it. And yeah. so there were four thing, four podcasts I wanted to do before I even started, which was the grenade, which was meant to cover either NWA, WCW, or WWF years at a time. Um mm -hmm. 80s 90s um there was uh, money warfare which we we recorded i don't know maybe four episodes before i even began putting it out um covering the monday night war from beginning week at a time or whatever a couple weeks at a time to begin with because the show was only an hour each at that right. point but it's like the grenade go through the notes so there's always news pay-per-view results and cover what was going on on both shows uh who we thought was, you know, the winner, which one had the better product, not based on the ratings, but what we just thought. And then we would cover the ratings and discuss that as well. And so that went on for a while too. So that was, I thought, okay, now I got the eighties people and eighties, nineties kids. That's me. And then I got the Monday or Monday night war era fans. So we got that covered and eventually it was going to taper off into a territory show, which would cover yet another area. And then just because I loved it. So 
I had a special place in mind for a Memphis show. And so it's still sitting in my uh, my podcast, the, the name of my original show I was going to have just for Memphis. And then over time, it just became overwhelming. Steve left and it was like, I can't do it really. You know, I was doing Monday Warfare a little bit for myself, too. And I'm like, this is not something you can do by yourself, the Monday Night War. There's just yeah. too much. You need conversation with that. And so, but we, you know, the grenade went on. And uh, eventually I introduced regional wrestling. That's when I get the territory stuff going. And once I realized there's just no time to just do a, a Memphis by itself, which I still would have loved to have done, but there's just so much going on. Uh, it's like, well, we got to get Memphis involved in the regional wrestling show. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you, for your regional wrestling, you you know, Georgia in 81, UWF 86, Memphis 85, those are all really good um, eras to cover. And there's so much more to to cover with all of those you can go backwards mm -hmm. or forwards with georgia uwf or memphis and you know you still got good stuff to do um but man it's so much to juggle like so walk us through kind of your so, so right now as we sit here today as far as the ones that you still do you know on a, on the reg week to week basically you've got the wrestling memory grenade you've got three different regional wrestlings uh, you've now mixed the captain's, uh, what is corner? it? Uh, captain's corner mm -hmm. is now a, a, what bi-weekly is what yeah. you shoot for on that mostly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we got the again, we Japanese about, show. We got all that stuff. And then the, 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 I was going to say the Japanese show would be work by itself. I mean, the amount of, and I know Dan yeah. helps with a lot of that, but still. Oh, he's, amount, yeah, he's. Yes. Of information y'all share per episode. Um, yeah, that could be overwhelming to a lot of people just to keep that up. So yeah. give us an idea of your process of how Ray makes this magic happen week in and week out. Not to mention Bob Root. We can't forget that one as well. No, you can't. I, I can't. <laughs> we, we can't. Every Tuesday, I believe it is, uh, normally anyway, working with Bob, uh, which is always fun to get him on there. And he's, you know, he's always so just for his, you know, the, all the crap that they give him for st trying to steal a territory and whatever horse shit and stuff like that. The guy's been nothing but just uh, the nicest human being in the world since I've known, I've known him for a year. I mean, yeah. known him pretty well. I've, you know, there's lots of things that should have, could have set him off. And he's just very calm about almost everything. So, so you know, not, not the happiest camper when certain stories are trickled out, but in general, he's cool. But, you know, if it was like a year ago, maybe not even, I could have easily told you exactly how my week went. Every week's different now because I just, yeah. it's like, there's 30 minutes. Go. Okay. What do I got to do? Okay. So there's never any free time. There's never any downtime. Anytime I take a week off, it's not a week off. You know that, Gene. We talk all the time. Uh, I am constantly writing. I'm, I'm watching videos, taking notes. I'm researching, reading books, reading, uh, you just research, um, talking with people. Maybe I'm editing stuff, even though I, you know, I've recorded it two weeks ago, but I got to edit it. So my weeks off are not weeks off by any means. It's time for me to catch up on things that, you know, I need to catch up on to be ready for the, the next round. But, you know, getting ready for the grenade, the grenade is very overwhelming. Uh, I don't think people realize it. You just go on there and you magically have these sound bites and you just, you know, no, you gotta, you, you gotta go through everything. So you go through all the notes, you go through the torches, you go through the observers of the time, you read all those, you go online, look for extra stories and things month to month. You break all of it down, figure out, is everybody saying the same thing? Did this really happen? Whatever. You got to keep pulling up the history of WWE, looking at the results to see, did he really wrestle this? Did this really, you know? It's a lot of work. You know, if I just wanted to half-ass it and read crap, read some results and call it a day, I could do that, but I, I won't and I never have and I never will. So hopefully, you know, if anybody ever wants to point to something, whether they like me or not, uh, they can say, you know what, at the very least, you can go on there and I bet it's accurate. And that's, you know, what I go for with that. But for the TV, you know, I've been doing, try to do two TVs at a time. And in 93, you guys will notice I was doing like a month at a time after Steve <laughs> left. And there's good reason for that. I just wanted to be done with it. Yeah. I mean, it, there was no other show I was doing during that period just so I could spend entire weeks 
to do the month because that's just how meticulous I was. It was like, yeah. I hate this and I'm still going to do it right. Right. So still the sound bites still made it sound fun, exciting, whatever. Like you said, got to have that energy. What's the point of doing it if you don't, but right now, man, it's just whatever available time you have. That's what you do. Do I have an hour? Okay. Uh, the grenade, two weeks of TV. That's 45 minutes of superstars, 45 minutes of challenge, no commercials. That's three hours right there for two weeks of that, not counting prime time and grabbing the sound bites, you know, grab the sound bites and then grab the damn sound bites. People, people who have never done any editing or anything like that, they don't understand just the headache of getting all those sound bites together. Yeah. And something that's not lost on me doing a review show every week is like, I've heard alleged deep dives of shows where they're just like, and Bob Penn, Steve and, and Joe Penn, Dave and Dave and Joe Penn, Steve and Bob. And, yeah. you know, and then that's, that's it. You're not just sc- scrolling through these shows for results. I mean, you break yeah. down the high, some of these matches, you break down damn near the whole match, but in others, you know, it's just like, you know, he hit him with this, he hit him with that. And then here comes this spot and right. then this. And so I was like, all right, so he's not just watching these matches. He's noting, he's notating all the stuff in these matches. So you're, you know, yeah. that's, that's a lot, folks. I, I want you people to understand the time and effort it takes to do that. I mean, in one episode of the, where you're covering TV, like I said, where you're covering, you know, a challenge, a superstars, a prime time, all these clips, and then noting the matches, and then, like you said, then the news, the news ones, where you got to go to all these different sources for all this different stuff. Yeah, it's a. It would be a, if you all you did was the grenade. That's a lot of work. That's but a then, week's worth of work. Yeah, <laughs> that's a week's worth of work right there. But then you're yeah. doing, you know, regional wrestling. That's three different territories that you got to watch the TV and make the notes, yeah. and you got to go research cards of. You know, when you hear, when people hear you name off these results of, you know, Georgia went to Gunnersville, Alabama, which amuses me because <laughs> I'm like an hour from there and Gadsden's where I live now and they're always having matches there and stuff like that. But you got to go look all that up. It's not like it's just all sitting there in front of you. you right. Know? Yeah. So uh, if nothing else comes out of this interview, I want people to appreciate because you're not going to say it. That's why I wanted to do this interview here on, on my channel because Ray Russell's not ever going to tell you the backstory of Russell Copey on a Russell Copey show. One, he didn't have freaking time. And two, <laughs> he's not going to tell you how much work goes in these things unless I drag it out of him. So I decided to, to, to bring you here just not to, I mean, not, I don't want anybody to cry fucking river for you or anything, <laughs> but just, just to understand, you know, the, the level of, of dedication that it takes. And also for people to understand too, I have heard, <laughs> So I have had three different podcasters tell me directly. One per another person I heard say it on someone else's podcast, but I've heard th- three different podcasters said to me directly, "I don't have time for all that damn research and all the note taking and shit like you and Ray do." <laughs> well, then don't fucking do it. How about that? Yeah, that means you don't have. Time I couldn't to do a podcast. Why are you doing right. it if you're not going to put right. in the work? If you're not going to put any effort into this, if you're just flinging some shit out there to say you have a podcast, <laughs> podcast yeah, right, and the thing yeah. is, is like some of the guys that told me that have multiple podcasts. Like, well, hey, why don't you just have one podcast that you put work into and make it good instead of having three half-ass podcasts that you don't put any effort into it? And to guys like me and you, I, I, I consider that a slap in the face because you're just muddy in the water. You're just you're just you know adding to the crowd of useless podcast that people have to sift through to get to ones that are actually have anything useful to say or offer. Um, yeah. I, th- I think my biggest takeaway when I, when I do these shows is at the very end of the day, people can say, I don't like his voice. I don't like his personality, blah, 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 blah. But at least they'll say, you know what though? There's, there's some people I can say that about too, but you know what though? At least I know when I'm listening or reading their work or whatever stuff, at least I know that it's accurate and you know, it's, it's quality. Right. So even if it's not my cup of tea, at least I know this person when they take notes or when they cover results, no matter what the case, maybe they have a podcast. Uh, at least I know at the end of the day, whatever there's coming out of their mouth, it's, you know, it's credible. It's, it's a good yeah. resource for something. 
And so that's that's kind of what my takeaway has always been. It's like if I'm going to put something out there, unless it's just a happy go lucky fun pilot, let's say let's be funny, yeah. let's have a good time. That's fine. There's there's room for things like that. I mean, you know, so Jim Cornette has fun every week and he makes a gazillion dollars trash in AEW. So yeah. there's certainly room out there for things like that. But the type of shows I'm doing, it's just covering wrestling history. Got to have some fun with it. Uh, people that don't want to have fun with it, they don't have to listen. That's fine. If they get offended by, you know, insulting Dusty Rhodes or uh, having a little too much fun with Memphis at times. I mean, that's it is what it is. But I love all these things. I respect all these things. But just like your best friend, you you you, you fuck with them, right? You screw with them. You make fun yeah. of, you know, their flaws and you have fun with each other and things. And that's just kind of how I look at, at wrestling to me. It's like it's been in my world for 40 years. So, yeah, I can have fun with it. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. And I'm not trying to insult anyone, you know? So Yeah, I mean, that's why I enjoy doing the Memphis Regional Wrestling with you because me and you have that same mindset. Like, hey, we're going to put over the good stuff and we're going to have some fun with the not-so-good stuff. What else are you going to do? We're not going to... It's insulting... To me, it's insulting to the listener for us to sit there and act like all of this is just pure gold. At that point, we have no credibility. You know, if if we try to tell you, man... This freaking Cyclops, this was fucking amazing. This guy is you know, just a hell of a hand, and he's going to have some five-star matches. Like, no, it's silly. It's it's silly. You know, we're going to have some fun with that. But then we put over how awesome the stuff Macho Man's doing. But then we're yeah. also going to have a laugh when he's got his damn belt out there wrapped around a fire <laughs> firewood holder. Yeah. <laughs> and his brother's out there in a freaking <laughs> suit, suit of armor, armor. in yes. the middle of a pasture. Reading a poem in the in a windstorm, you know. Yes, exactly. Because <laughs> what else? What else can you do with that? But absolutely. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, since I've been doing the the USWA podcast, you know, I get some messages from people sometimes, or like, oh, you were kind of hard on them this week, you know, like y'all 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 should make it a little more fun. I'm like, well, I'm sorry that we spent our entire week watching this show and I spent hours clipping this stuff and making these notes to put over a card that had seven matches with five of them ending in a fucking disqualification. I'm sorry. I'm going to bitch about that. I don't think that's good. I don't think that did anything good no. for the territory. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> sorry. That's my opinion. If you don't like my opinion, you don't, you don't have to listen. I, I, I hope you do. Um, right. Cause you'll probably like what we're going to have to say next week, but justify that to me. You know, I mean, me and you have had plenty of, in 85, you know, there's been plenty of head scratchers, you know, Texas death matches ending in, you know, disqualifications and just yeah. random weird, you know, weird stuff. It, it you know, kind of, it is what it is. And Hey, it's Bob Smith, and guess what? The Outdated Wrestling Hour is now part of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. But hey, no fear, you're still going to hear the unique guests, comedy, music, authors, journalists, funny people. Who knows who's going to end up on the Outdated Wrestling Hour. Remember, it's all new and all old. So check it out in the WrestleCopia Podcast Network and wherever you get your podcasts. Listen, if you know what's good for you. and gentlemen, welcome to Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling, the podcast that's based on the old school, but can still help you find the good stuff from today. Jimmy Street and the Plastic Sheik, Jared, are the undisputed tag team champions of the wrestling podcast world. From thought-provoking topics to superstar interviews to action figure expertise, this team does it all, and all they ask is, Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling! Every other Thursday, wherever you listen to podcasts. Back to something you was talking about before, even with three of us on this show. There's me and there's always me and two co-hosts, except for, right. you know, like me and you did one alone. Me and Brian did one of these two of us, but it was all, it's usually always me and my other two co-hosts. Some weeks, there's just not a lot there. You know, yeah. you got to make, yeah. you got to have some fun with it because as I, I think one of the more recent ones I sent you, I, when I sent it to you in the email, I put, 
there's not even a great headline for this one, dude. Like, there's no, yeah. there's no real grabber this week. Like, it's just kind of yeah, we're, so, we're still is. coasting off last week's results. Yeah, yeah. let's hope yeah. everybody's still excited that Savage was there last week uh, because this week was a, a bit of a snooze fest, and that's what it is. And I'm like, I can just imagine what freaking you know this is 93 Memphis. I can just imagine what 93 WWF was to do plow through a month at a time at least. <sighs> If you take a month's worth, there's got to be a few good things here and there for you to Little latch bit. on to <laughs> rather than, you know, if you just, whoo, okay, this week, uh, what did Doink do? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Is, so, you know, you've got, um, it's not just the podcast. You you have a, a Russell Copia Patreon. Oh, yeah. That has a ton of an absolute ton of great content for people. You know, you've had for the longest, you've had the $5 tier that for my money, you, you know, you, you put too much stuff on there for five bucks. Like people should, you know, should thank you immensely for what you've been giving them for $5. <laughs> and of course, now you got the super fan tier and with all this Japanese stuff that's coming that you can't find anywhere else, it's a bargain. But tell me a little bit about, the concept of, of when you decided, Hey, I need to, I need to make a Patreon. We need to find a way to at least pay, help pay some of these, as you say in the commercial, help pay some of these bills because yeah. uh, for those of you who don't know, folks, podcasting isn't free. Um, no. They you don't know, give you the equipment. They don't give you the space. No. Uh, <laughs> it it, it costs it. money. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people, they don't have a website. You know, I, I have a website, so I pay for the hosting there and all the things that go yeah. along with that as well. No, it's not, you know, that's cliche. Help us pay the bills, guys. You know, everybody says that. What bills? Well, do you have, maybe everybody does have bills. I don't know. But yeah, with ours, there's, there's a ton of them. You know, the hosting, web hosting bills, but the uh, uh, the uh, podcasting hosting bills, the, everything yeah. in between, my software editing bills, uh, the, the bills we use for these video casts we do and things like that. So there's a lot and it adds up and it's, it's, not, a, it's not chump change, right? So... Uh, but no, I, I don't know exactly what month we started the Patreon, but it was fairly early. I said, let's do, it was, it was just a few months in really. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to do the, uh, the watch alongs, the Patreon exclusive watch alongs. And the idea behind that was, um, doing a lot of the pay-per-views that, that coincided with the WCW and WWF, the Monday night war, the Monday warfare show. And also just some old Coliseum videos, old Saturday night's main events, clashes, things for fun. And these were things that were at the time on the WWE network, uh, this pre Peacock. And so you would, you know, like Conrad would do, and a lot of guys would do, they would say, queue up your WWE network, press play, blah, 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 go. And that's what we would do. Uh, the Coliseum videos, we did a little something different so that people could watch along with us, but it was, you know, it was fun going back and just doing those and adding some extra content. So that was like extra podcasts for, for, the $5 tier, but also digital downloads and everything else. The, the notes, all my notes that I take, I figure, Hey, they're here anyway. But I mean, still, that was a lot of work to just give away. And I'm sure some people have utilized for other things and gave me no credit for at some point, if they were smart anyway. And so, <laughs> but I mean, to do all that and put it up there for five bucks, we've never, we've never like upcharged. It's always been, it's been $5 for over four years now and still five bucks. And then eventually, you know, at the turn of uh, last year, we got into the video casting, kind of looked into that, messed with it. And we did the grunt for free. Everybody got that on the $5 yes. tier WrestleMania four. And after that, it became part of the VIP super fan tier for a few bucks more. You guys go check it out, you know, limited, limited spots there on the uh, super fan tier. So check it out today. But I mean, yeah, just everything. I agree with you. You know, if I, outside looking in, I always think like, man, that's a lot of shit for $5. Like, this is a pretty damn good deal. I can't, you know, I do offer quite a bit. I'm not, like, trying to, you know, pat myself on the back. That's just, I, you know, I hope people utilize it, take advantage of it. Anytime anybody joins, I send them a message, welcome aboard. And they're all personal messages. There's not a copy and paste job. And I always remind them, though, go check out the collections. Look at all the different things we have for you guys. I want you to get every bit you can for that five bucks or, whatever, you know, whatever uh, tier you sign up for. And... So, yeah, but initially it was, it was a fun way to give me a reason to go and add some things that wasn't part of the grenade, wasn't part of Monday Warfare, just the old Coliseum videos, the old pay-per-views and, and whatnot. I love those Coliseum videos, dude. Like, 
that was one of the first things I checked out when I joined the Patreon was some of those watch alongs. Uh, I've got like the whole, took me a while to finally get them all, but I've got the whole collection of like the clamshell wow. Coliseum yes. videos over here on the other side of the room. And I really love that era. Even, but even the silly Sean Mooney shit later on where he's, you know, portraying his own fucking space trek or some shit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, I, the only thing I'll say about that era is when Tony Schiavone came in and he got to take over putting the, the tapes together in 89, they got substantially better wrestling wise, right? Like yeah. they started making more sense. I mean, never mind the fact that the, the one, whatever the best of the WWF, or whatever it was with the three Bushwhacker matches outside of that, most of them were, it was, it was fun. It was like a, a lot of fun TV taping matches and whatnot. Tony, Tony put a lot more effort and thought into it than whatever was going into it before that. But I'm, I'm with you, man. I grew up on the clamshell case ones too. And they all, you know, they're all near and dear to my heart. But it was it was fun to go back and do the first, you know, I, it wasn't that long ago when I restructured Patreon that I said, holy shit, we did five of these best. Of, I didn't remember going that far into the best of the WWF. So I was like, that's pretty cool. I have to go back and revisit the rest of those someday. Yeah, hopefully. I was gonna say, you, you get ready to re, redo some more. Uh, holler at you video boys, cast, you know, man. Video cast that shit. I'll be down for a video cast of, of some of those for sure. Oh, hell yeah. And for me, man, I've told you this before from from the minute I joined the magazine scans alone are worth it to me. Uh, cause like I told you, I, I was a big magazine collector and, and those all still live in plastic totes. Some here at my yeah. house and some four hours away from here at my parents' house and all that. But who wants to go digging all that stuff out of a damn tote? Yeah. So as they come yeah. up, I immediately, you know, download them and go through them and check it out. So, uh, like I say, that alone is worth it, but there's so much. And like you say, just those, those notes, I'll go through and read the notes and realize that in the process of the show, I, I, I might have missed it when you said it or, or misunder, you know, misunderstood the context of it or something. So it's good to be able to go back, especially the, I mean, there's so much stuff that you guys go through, but some of the stuff that you don't go through yep. on the uh, Pro Wrestling Academy of all those Japanese results and everything. Um, and folks, that's, uh, I'm telling you, I keep hyping this every time I'm on here. You think I'm getting a cut of that or some shit, but I'm serious though. Like that is worth joining alone because there's so much stuff coming your way that there's nowhere else really to see it. And there's definitely nowhere else to see it where you've got two knowledgeable guys like Dan and Ray talking over it to kind of tell you and give you context, give you the backstory. I mean, I, I, I try to watch old Japanese footage and I don't get very far into it before I get a headache. And I'm like, I can't listen to this commentary. I don't know what the fuck's going on right now. I just know Stan Hansen's beating the shit out of somebody and that's pretty <laughs> cool. But you know, once I get past that match and it's just two Japanese guys that I don't necessarily know who they are, why they're fighting. I just know they're beating the hell out of each other, but man, these announcers sure are more excited than what the action seems to be justifying, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, you know, that VIP super fan tier, that's where the, uh, the J Japanese show notes are. And you're right. You know, go look at the show notes. There are 30, 40, 50, 60 pages of information. That w and we just do one episode uh, on that 60 pages of information. All of that's not on the show. We just cover what on the show, what we feel is, you know, quality. The, the most, we try to hit all the major points, but we also want to drill to death all of the results and things like that. You guys can go yes. read that. And it might not mean anything to you, but maybe somebody wants to see how everything played out over a tour. Uh, how many times this guy went over or that guy went over and just all these, it's there, right? So it's there year to year. You guys can go back and maybe we get in 1970 one day and you go, man, I heard that name before. And you can pull up the old show notes and go, Oh shit, this guy was here this year or that year. Oh, he did do some things. And so it's kind of fun to put everything in there. So Dan is amazing. I can't begin to tell you how many things that he went, got, got and bought and, uh, Scott from Japan, he contacted people like just a super fan, you know, 20, 30 years ago, he found people that only spoke Japanese and he, he spoke in broken English so they could understand him in, in emails to get them wow. to translate things for him and send him things. And, you know, he's, if a, if a wrestling match exists from Japan, Dan has it period. Period. I mean, if, if, if he wanted to, if he set out to do a Japanese wrestling podcast, especially one that was going to be teaching history. I don't know. There's another American there that you could have picked that could have been better for this. I don't no, know anybody who has the resources and the knowledge and just the love of it. Cause this is, 
I mean, this is like usually we said everybody's got their wheelhouse. Well, Japanese wrestling, you know, Dan's been studying this for years and years, and like you say, just compiling all these different matches and results, and it's it's amazing. Yeah, so I never pitch a show to anybody. I never go out and find not like this some ego thing. I just I want somebody to want to be here want to be part of WrestleCopia, want to do a podcast that has the desire to cover a specific territory or this or that. So I, I just throw it every once in a while, I'll throw feelers out there. Is anybody interested in this? And if they bite, we, we talk and, you know, it goes from there. Maybe something happens out of that. Maybe it doesn't. However, at the same time with Dan, that was somebody I actually courted, which is, uh, you know, I had that in mind for a long time. I wanted to do the Japanese. I wanted to tell the history of Japanese wrestling. And... I've told Dan this more than once. It's, I'm not just making this up. Uh, if Dan had turned it down, it, the show wouldn't exist. I've told him there is nobody else on earth I would attempt to do this show with other than you. The knowledge, the history, the background, the studying, everything from the English language, it's its not going to get any better. It doesn't even come close. I, I don't, you know, and there's probably some people upset. Oh, I'm like, I've been watching Japanese wrestling. I've been since Masawa and Kawada and Kobashi. Okay. But do you know the history and do you know every other this, that, and the other and the ins and outs? And did you try to learn, yeah. which is what I did growing up, you know, the magazines pre-internet, not that you could learn a lot from magazines because it was still kayfabe, but right. every magazine I dissected every name I, I memorized that I hadn't seen before. Just every tape I rented, they, they would, Oh, who, who did man, who did you, who, who managed you gorilla? Oh, wild red berry. Okay. Well now I know, I don't know who wild red berry is. But I, now he's now he's in here, and over time I oh oh he's on a classic videotape I rented or something fifties or something. Okay, that's the guy that managed Gorilla, and you you just it slowly comes together, right? And that's how I learned, and I think Dan was the same way with Japanese. Like whatever he could gain over time, that's what he did, and you know that's how you that's truly how you learn if you really want to study something. People got it easier today; they can just go online. If they oh, work yeah. hard enough, they can study anything. But you know. Yeah, they, they don't know how how we had to work for it back in the day. Like, if me and you are sitting there, of course, we wouldn't be sitting here talking online, but if me and you are in person or on the phone, you're like, hey, man, did you ever see that so-and-so match? Like, no, oh, I'd love to see that. Well, you could just pull up freaking YouTube or, or the Peacock streaming service. You had to go get on these trading boards yeah. and, and try to try to hope you had something to offer somebody to trade them or, or, or buy it. And now you're rolling the dice on what kind of quality it was going quality, to be, or if it was always, even going to be the match that you're looking for. I mean, my or if God, you, if you even mean, get the tape, <laughs> exactly. If you even, I got burned quite a few times over the years, but man, like how many people, <laughs> how many assholes would go on those boards and be like, I've got it. I've got the last battle of Atlanta cage match. Oh, I yeah. got it from my brother's cousin's uncle who, who worked for Ole Anderson and he fished it. I heard that Jim Cornette story. He fished it out of a gutter behind the building and man, people would order it and it'd be, you know, it'd either be nothing or it would be some random match they had, you know, on TV or something. Right. It would never be, but people were, people wanted that match so badly that people couldn't resist going, Fuck, this might be real. And if I can get my hands on it, I can trade for anything in the world. Like, this yeah, is, yeah. <laughs> this will be the ultimate. It was. What do they call ship. it forever? Uh, the Holy Grail, right? Until it yes. came out. Yeah. That it, and that damn uh, Bret Hart match. With I was going to say, uh, <laughs> like, what a comparison for yeah. Holy Grails, right? Yeah, yeah. Tom McGee. <laughs> and you finally see it, and like, all right, that's what we were yeah. looking for. Thanks a lot, Melts. Yeah, but. <laughs> But yeah, man, it took a lot of work, but I mentioned in tape trading, that's why the first time that I heard you say Dan's name, I remember every, you know, every list of tape traders that I looked at that had substantial Japanese tapes, they had Dan's name on there somewhere. It was a comp that he had put together, you mm -hmm. know, he, that's how I knew that name was from the trading boards and you know, when people would tell, you know, put post stuff on wrestling classics or kayfabe memories, they would reference, you know, I, I got this from Dan or I heard this from Dan Kennedy or whatever, you know. So mm -hmm. when I heard you say that name, I'm like, oh, shit, he's went and got a the heavy hitter of, of 
Japanese uh, wrestling. Like this is going to be something. Yeah. And, uh, I've, I've you know, probably been training with Dan more than twenty years, off and on. Yeah. You know. That's cool. I uh, well, you know we both mentioned in this show our, our love of collecting wrestling magazines as kids and. That's why I think it's pretty damn cool now that, you know, Bob Smith has joined WrestleCopia. Yeah. You know, yeah. With his history with that Pro was... Wrestling Illustrated. <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's a pretty good get, I think. Yeah, so I'd heard a little bit of what Bob had done, and I knew he had worked with the Pro Wrestling Illustrated, like all the after mags, if you will, and, and things like that from that peak period for me, which was late 80s, early 90s, and, and whatnot. But I didn't listen to him uh, do any of the shows that he had done in regards to talking about what he had done. I listened to him speak with other people. And so when I had him on in real time and I found out, oh yeah, I invented the PWI 500. Oh yeah, I wrote the first two by myself. It wasn't the first one, but the second one was like my, I won't say holy grail because I had it, but it was like my, well, I don't want to be sacrilegious, but my Bible really, I carried around with me all yeah. the time. I, I probably looked at it every day for months, just looking at it and studying yeah. all the names that I didn't know. and. You know, that's, again, going back to trying to study everything. You know, some people, a lot of kids, normal kids, I'd say, watched wrestling and had fun. They watched their Ric Flairs and their Macho Mans, and they had fun with the stories that were on the TV screen. Meanwhile, I'm trying to, you know, figure out who number 476 is that only wrestles in Jersey or whatever shit. But, yeah, that's me, I guess. <laughs> right. I mean, that's what I was telling, you know, whenever I, I don't remember if it was on his show or my show, but when I was talking to Bob, and I was like, man, there are so many wrestlers that when they finally popped up in a promotion that I could see, be it WCW, WWF, or even like, you know, Memphis or Continental or whatever, I'd be like, holy shit, I read about that guy in one of those introducing articles, yeah. you know, in one of the after mags, you know, and, and usually he was the one responsible for those. He was the one that was, yeah. you know, yeah, he put those together. Yeah. writing those and putting those together. And there's so many guys that when I got into tape trading, I sought out tapes of them because I had read those articles. And, you know, some of them paid off. Some of them was like, Okay, right. not as cool as they found it like when I read about them. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> definitely not Damien, pictures, Damien Demento. Exactly. That match in <laughs> pictures looked a lot cooler before you saw it in motion. <laughs> like, <laughs> you guys are really helping some of those dudes out for sure. Yeah. I mean, they were the internet. I'm sure they realized the power they had. But, you know, it can't be said enough to the, the new modern day generation what those magazines did for these guys. Because it yeah. was our imagination, right? It was a picture, and it was our imagination. You know, My that was that was really were those, was it. those 500s and the PWI results every week. I would look at, yeah. you know, I like the WWF results in WCW, but I love looking at the obscure, like, indie shows. One, reading names and trying to figure out who they were or learn something about them. But then, like you say, you know, like, Oh, look what he's doing now. I, you know, this guy, I hadn't seen this guy on WWF in two years. I wondered what happened to him. You know, he's in Poughkeepsie, you know, wrestling, right. you know. <laughs> you know, uh, I can't think of an obscure name to throw out right now. Like Tommy Cairo <laughs> or whatever. There you go. Uh, <laughs> the Metal Maniac should have been my yeah. go-to. Well, that. Jimmy Snuka was on that card then. That's true. <laughs> yeah, if those guys were there, Jimmy Snuka wasn't far behind. <laughs> So uh, I think we've pretty much covered the history pretty well. So for, God forbid, if people don't know, I mean, I run the commercials on on every episode that I do here on the, on my channel and on my Spotify, and, I, and it'll be in this episode. By now, we're at the end. They will have already heard them. Uh, but tell everybody, uh, hit them with the old hard sell on uh, how they can find uh, WrestleCopia and how they can join yeah. the Patreon and, and be part of the fun. Sure, yeah. I mean, obviously, the website, WrestleCopia.com. That's WrestleCopia.com. Uh, the name Wrestle for wrestling and Copia. Uh, plenty, having an abundance of. It's a copious amount of wrestling at WrestleCopia.com. Of course, all the shows, once you get there and look at them all, look at them all there, we got like almost a dozen now shows there at WrestleCopia. Yeah. Uh, they all have their own streaming platform. You know, they're all available on all a the streaming platforms. A few of them platforms. are quite good. Yeah, a few no, of I'm them. I'm just kidding. They're, they're, all, they're, all, they're all great, <laughs> <laughs> we have we have quite a few shows from the grenade regional wrestling obviously your shows retro wrestling review uh dangerous conversations doug gilbert uh part of the uh brand now uh, obviously bob roop 
And just on down the line, Dave Dynasty recently joined, Bob Smith joined, the other ships there, um, Nick Massey, Captain Nick Massey and the Captain's Corner Pod. We we have some fun interviews there with some guys you wouldn't expect, you know, like uh, Fidel Sierra, Ricky Santana was an awesome interview. Would yes. love to do that again. Um, just lots of great uh, stuff going on right now with all the different podcasts and yeah, it's uh, you know you can check them out there to see all what all we have to offer. But you know, obviously, all those shows are available on all your favorite streaming platforms. So go check them out wherever you Apple, Spotify, on down the line. Um, but also, yeah, the Patreon is there, uh, the five dollar all access tier, and then also the VIP super fan tier, which uh, guarantees you a little more than the all access tier. So I don't know if I, I might have to change the name of the all access tier now. I don't know. But uh, yeah, Super Fan Tier is going to get you even more show notes, including your retro review show notes, Dan's, all of his Japanese show notes, um, all the video casts coming forward that we're going to do, Gene, whoever else I do, grenade type uh, episodes with, regional wrestling video casts with. Me and Dan have a slew of awesome uh, Japanese video casts coming very shortly as well. So you guys are going to want to check all that out over at patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. And uh, be sure to follow us on social media. On X, formerly Twitter, at Wrestling Grenade. Also, Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. Check out everything. I'm always posting videos, pictures, yada, yada there. But uh, yeah, Patreon, WrestleCopia.com. And uh, follow us, guys. Be a part of it. And subscribe to the uh, WrestleCopia Wrestling Memory Grenade YouTube channel because all oh, the yeah, different YouTube. episodes that we review uh, go up there on the YouTube channel. So make sure you check that yeah. out. And again, just to double down on this real quick, because you know, you go look around, you can look around on Amazon, and there's people that put out wrestling books now that are <laughs> less than 50 pages long. So, we're talking show notes for these, these pro wrestling academies that are 50 and 60 pages. It's like they're putting out a book, a wrestling book on Japanese wrestling almost every, every time they put an episode out, and it's uh, broken definitely down, worth it, typically by year. So, basically, it's like a, yes. a year in each book, if you will. <laughs> listen to the most recent one to hear about the saga of mr atomic that was fun. mr atomic uh, yeah mr atomic's awesome post the <laughs> video too guys go check that out <laughs> yes absolutely well man I've, I've enjoyed talking to you like you said me and you talk pretty frequently yeah. and uh, i knew this would be uh, a fun conversation and like i said just to kind of give people a little background of of you know where wrestlecopia came from and how it all came to be and a little bit about your fandom and and uh that all this all this stuff doesn't happen by accident. You put a lot of work and a lot of research into these shows, and and it definitely uh, is evident by the by the finished product. And I uh, just personally want to thank you for letting me be a, a part of WrestleCopia, having my my yeah, two was... shows on there, uh, and and being a part of uh, the Memphis eighty five. Doug's having a blast with this podcast. Uh, I got That's to hang awesome. out with him last weekend in Jackson, and. Uh, his wife was there running the gimmick table. And at one point she pulled me aside and she's like, Doug's having a great time with this podcast. She said, I'm not going to lie. I was pretty skeptical when he first said he was going to do this. She said, <laughs> I was worried that after a few weeks that it would be more than he wanted to deal with. And he would, uh, he would tap out on you. She's like, but he's having a blast. And like, every time I turn around, he's like, Oh, hey, we can have this person on and we can talk about this. And, and he's on fire right now, like recruiting guests. Like I, I'm not gonna name a bunch of names right here, just in case they don't all pan out. But right, he's uh he's reached out and talked to a number of people that uh, are gonna be a lot of a lot of fun to talk to. And so uh, it's been cool getting to to do that show with him every week, and it's been a great addition uh, to the brand too. So yeah, um, no, it's it's great to have him and uh, for doing that. Yeah, I you know I do too. I haven't got to speak to Doug myself. I've you know I've been letting you kind of handle handle that side of things, but I've been listening to the shows as you you know finish them, and I, I'm enjoying them. You know, I very much am, and it seems like he's you know genuinely interested in engaging. We we've heard other podcasts with some names from the past that are probably there just to well collect a paycheck. I'm sure some of those you know the notable guys that can draw draw a few bucks just by you know people hearing their name on you know going to be part of a podcast, but. No, it's, it's great to have him there. It's great to, you know, know that he's engaging and interested and you can tell in his voice and his, it's, that's what makes the show so fun, I think. And it grows every week as we look at the numbers and people are just, you know, genuinely 
uh, and interested in hearing what Doug has. He's such a history career. It wasn't okay. Well, yeah, Doug didn't. Uh, he wasn't the world champion of the World Wrestling Federation. Okay, but yeah. Doug had been everywhere, done everything, seen everything. Uh, he was in locker rooms at times when you might not have realized it. Uh, of course, his father, was, he's a second-generation wrestler, so he's got the stories from the guys from before him. He's also got yeah. you know stories involving his brother, Eddie Gilbert, and on down the line. So, yeah, Doug's got a, a billion of them. I'm sure we have just uh, broken – just just bro- oh, we, <laughs> broke we haven't scratched broken into the it. surface because i no. keep finding i keep finding out more stuff i'm like oh you were around for that and he's like oh yeah i was like 10 years old but i was there in the dressing room you know i was there with eddie you know I was, he, he was there for a lot more mid-south stuff than i realized that you know he took trips down there and you know we sat down with tommy rich and jackson and recorded an interview with him that dropped uh well, yesterday, as we record this, this probably won't come out until Sunday or Monday, but Tommy had a blast, and uh, he he called Doug a couple days later, and he's like, hey, when are you going to have me back on that podcast? And Doug's like, well, it hadn't come out yet, Tommy. He's like, well, get it out there. I want to do another one. That was fun. Uh, he, said it, he said, you know, a lot of these podcasts, he said they feel like interrogation. He said, that just felt like I was hanging out telling stories with my friends. Yeah, and Doug said, right. well, it's because yeah. you were, you know? He said, <laughs> so... Uh, uh, Tommy's going to kind of be a, a regular uh, coming on here pretty frequently. And Lord knows Tommy's got a ton of great <laughs> stories. Uh, so I'm super excited about that as well. So, uh, yeah, man, we got a lot of good stuff going on at WrestleCopia. And I know you've got some other irons in the fire and some, some feelers out about some other things that, you know, we yeah, can look forward yeah, we're going to have new projects for regional wrestling. We got some winding down and just looking into some new things there with Portland, St. Louis, uh, Maybe I've talked to Steve Crawford about some uh, doing some interesting things with Memphis um, in the 70s and uh, just some other things going on, too. So lots of people coming at me with information. Chicago, uh, just lots of things going on right now. So we'll see where we go next in regards to that. I love covering the territories. It wasn't just meant to be two or three, you know, promotions. So we are going to, you know, it can expand as we oh, yeah. grow close to the so end of. so many balls yeah. you can juggle at one time. But, exactly. You know, and I'm excited to hear that because, you know, for me, my my fandom, like I said, picks up in the 80s. And I've studied back to about 83 in Memphis. Uh, so I'd really, really be interested in hearing some of that 70s Memphis to give some context to some of this stuff that goes on later in the 80s and get a little mm-hmm. history on that. And yeah. as I've told you off the air, I've always been fascinated with Portland, but I've never really had a lot of access to it. But that's something I do want to learn about. So I'm really... Really excited at the prospect of if you get something going with Portland and be able to listen to that each week too. So, yeah, well, we're working so on it. You know, it really comes down to you know finding the right people. Just like you know, with you in Memphis, I, I don't want to touch things unless I have the right people in place for a specific territory. But yeah, man, that's uh, it's been a blast and it's it's fun. We got a lot of things coming up, and you never know. Stay tuned to the social media. We'll be uh, announcing new things all the time. There you go. All right, folks. Thanks for checking it out. Remember, like you said, it's really, really easy to find everything that Ray has going on over at WrestleCopia.com. So make sure you check that out and make sure you check us out again here next week to see who I'll be interviewing next here on Retro Wrestling with Gene Jackson, live from the Wrestling Archive. This is Wrestling Nostalgia, the podcast that dives into wrestling history. Hey, wrestling fans, I'm Dave Dynasty. And if you enjoy podcasts that are knowledgeable and history-driven, then Wrestling Nostalgia is for you. With great guests and fun interviews, there are over 200 episodes in our archives. We chat with several first-time guests and often cover topics not discussed on other podcasts. Look up Wrestling Nostalgia on your favorite podcast platform and visit all of our links at linktree slash wrestlepod. That is L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash R-A-S-S-L-E-P-O-D. And remember, wherever you go, whatever you do, be good, be safe, and keep on growing.